Hello, everyone. A uh, very warm welcome to our last panel of the season for this uh, From Home Export Day panel. Uh, we are delighted to have you all uh, watching for this series again. And uh, we hope to see you again uh, very soon after the summer. So today, together with our loyal uh, Eric Denut, our moderator, we are going to talk about the dialogue between classical and pop music. Pop music has always been inspired by great music. And we are going to ask what are the interactions between the genres today. Uh, it's likely that uh, digital consumption and standardization modes uh, have accelerated the process of uh, uh, mixing the aesthetics. And it is also, um, it is an artistic question, but it's also cultural and economic. And to discuss the topic uh, today, we have an amazing panel of guests and Eric is going to introduce them in a, in a few seconds. So thank you again for being with us and let's stay uh, connected for our news and we are going to let you know uh, in the next weeks what is going to be on the menu for next season. So have a wonderful summer and see you soon again. Eric, over to you. Thanks so much, François. I pay homage to the Centre National de la Musique, François and her team, for having organized so greatly this cycle this season. And thanks to all of you, dear listeners and uh, viewers. And of course, a very warm thank you and welcome to our panelists. Some of them are even in production in uh, world class festivals like X. And uh, well, also more, also more, also more. Um, deeply honored of having all of you. Um, Limon Incest, that's the very name of a song by the French uh, pop singer uh, Serge Gainsbourg, inspired by a very famous classical piece and inspired, of course, our title, Pop and Art Music uh, in a Dialogue. I will start, ladies first, I will start with um, Tabitha McGrath, who is um, Associate Director at PolyArts, a, a boutique management division of the uh, very famous Harrison Parrot Management Company. We had some of uh, Habita colleagues already in the title and we thank her and them for that. Um, she will explain us in a couple of minutes uh, what she is doing at PolyArts, but she's also a trained classical trombonist. Uh, and so it, we um, can expect from her a very deep view on repertoires, business models, strategies, and what's going on in our market. Um, we stay maybe in the uh, British Islands with Luke. Luke Faulkner is a pianist and artist, which has rich, um, uh, unbelievable um, rich figures on, uh, on social media and internet, and is definitely a um, 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 figure of the modernity. Um, he will also explain um, uh, um, his education, um, which is of course first first class as a trained classical pianist, and he will tell us uh, a little bit more about the secrecies of his uh, personal and business uh, model, if I can say so. We cross uh, not not really the channel, but we go um, a little bit eastwards on the North Sea for once. And I um, um, greatly greet uh, uh, Matthias Kor here, who is in Hamburg, which is probably what the European continent has to offer, um, uh, um, which is the closest to, to the British, um, uh, British metropolis. Um, Matthias works for his own company and imprint Referat K in the field of classical music and pop for companies such as Deutsche Grammophon or the quite famous Reeperbahn Festival in, in Hamburg. He has been also the head of Naive in the uh, famous um, uh, friendship that we will be speaking very soon about again uh, in, in Germany. And he has created 30M records. I won't say more now, but you will see. It's something very, very special. Uh, thanks so much, Matthias, for being with us. Um, and we, we cross the Rhine River, um, uh, we go to Paris where Romain Vivien, Romain Vivien is managing director of Believe Music International. 
Um, he is a, a member of so many different public and, and, and institutions in, in France. I cannot name them, but I can tell you he is a key person in our industry. And we are very, very proud of having him. And we know his time is, is very, very um, uh, um, short, expensive. So we are all the more honored having him at the very beginning of the summer season. And that's also the case for Ilan Volkov, famous conductor, uh, who is in uh, producing now uh, a, a world premiere by Sami Odetamimi at Aix-en-Provence Festival in a couple of houses, and who uh, had the generosity of being with us. Thanks so much, both of you. So let's start now. Uh, I go back the, to Tabitha. Um, so as um, um, Françoise was e explaining, we have been observing for a long time now, the interactions between pop and art music. But our deep feeling at Centre National um, is that the classical music has never been so popular, at least in the last decade, thanks to the health crisis. We had a web seminar on this uh, last month, and it proved that indeed the streaming figures are quite astonishingly high for this. But some people have already been working on these um, aesthetical convergence and the fact that uh, maybe the way we do business in our industry has been converging and that's very much body arts for a couple of years so maybe that is a very first question to you and we ask probably more or less the same to um, our uh, uh, other participants is what is precisely converging between um, Art music, classical music, and pop music in in the last in the last year. From a well, thank you. That's a deep question. <laughs> from from a management point of view, and and I always speak uh, throughout all of this as a manager of art rather than managers of labels or or uh, or songs or anything like that. What I am increasingly finding is that the ask of the artist coming more and more like a pop musician audiences want to know artists in a much deeper way than perhaps they did 30, 40 years ago, even 10 years ago. The necessity for an artist to kind of be wrapped up wholly within themselves as opposed to just performing music, I find is, uh, is, is kind of rapidly kind of converging with the pop world. They're seen as icons. We are very concerned about how their social media is per um, perceived as. We are very concerned about their look, their style. Um, we are also, I find with some of my more contemporary classical artists, we're treating their live model and their recording model more and more like a pop cycle. So we might bring out an album, then they pull that album for the next year. And so, for example, I work with artists like Mari Sanden, Ataka Pet, Francesco Tristano. And for them, we always have these models in mind that, right, we're going to release an album in quarter two, 2022. Um, and then we're going to tour this music. They're going to post of this music in a defined set with lighting, with visuals, uh, generally straight through. So generally no interval. And, you know, we can talk about the live model in, in, in a much deeper way. And then we kind of put it, we push all that music through. And then we, by the time we're sort of starting to wrap up on that touring cycle, we start the next album. And then we go through that again. So there is always, I, I feel that that's one of the biggest things um, that's changed for me as a manager since starting in the industry. And it's that generally the kind of, when we go into the recording process ahead of time, it's bringing the audience with you and making sure that they're kind of getting on board with your say recital series for that, for that period. That's my kind of biggest uh, kind of view on everything to do with that. We spend an awful lot of money, more money on press and marketing and image branding. And, you know, all of my artists have social media representation. They all have press representation in different territories. Um, and they are kind of just decided that they need to give a piece of themselves when it comes to press. So those are my kind of two biggest things, I guess. And then on the... On the other side, as part of poly arts, um, we also have a lot of legacy artists. We see the pop come into the classical. So I also manage um, Stuart Copeland's classical output. He's obviously a very famous for being the drummer in the police. He's now a classical composer and opera composer. And we're bringing his police, uh, police music uh, on tour with an orchestra. So we're seeing actually it from both sides of um, 
the arc of an artist's career, you know, we're seeing that the new classical artists are having to be more pop, but then the old legacy pop artists are coming into the classical world because they hugely respect the industry. They know that they're going to have an excellent artistic output. They know that their fans want that kind of safe space in a beautiful hall with a, a lovely defined set period. So for me, the convergence between art music, as we say, and pop is happening at every single level. It's not a new thing. It's it's something that's kind of just happening, which is a very long answer. No, it's one, wonderful. <laughs> Maybe a great transition. May I ask Maestro Ilan yeah. Volkov if he ever conducted the Liverpool Oratorio by Paul McCartney, or if he's considering doing it. Maestro, you are, you are mute. You're mute. <clears throat> I, I wanted to make sure that no noise from here is coming out. So I, I never done the piece, um, but I, 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 I mean, I think there are many, many projects to do. In, I mean, there are many, many options to do new works with, well, let's say these kind of more famous names like Stuart Copeland or actually young names. You know, you can see that happening with, with uh, Mika Levy, for example, you know, um, doing, you know, quite big things. Uh, and so there's, it's a varied thing about talking about like the most per famous person who who can uh, fill Wembley Arena or some indie artist like Richard Youngs or who has been doing, you know, um, I wouldn't really call it pop music, but doing music that's not classical and uh, and doing small shows and working with these kind of people with orchestra. And I've done that quite a lot in Tectonics. So we, we work with artists like Stephen O'Malley from Sun, who is who's kind of like in a, in a metal band or it's a slash metal drone band. Uh, and they've got, they play sometimes festival hall or big festivals, but he also does classical music, you know? Um, so I kind of move sometimes between people that are exactly like what Tabitha was talking about, like people going from one genre to the other smoothly, you know, and interested in, in having an audience that's, a sit down audience without beers and listening or when they do their own thing where it's like smoke smoke machines and and it's it's loud so i think people are are very curious about having a career that's that's multi-layered that can do um that can reach different audiences and and they can do different music uh in those in those different collaborations so Somebody like Stephen O'Malley can do his sun stuff on one side, but then he can work during tectonics. I said to him, well, why? what about this composer? You love this composer. Alvin Lucia is an American composer. Why don't you just, I'll just ask him if he wants to write a piece for you and another colleague. Then he, and they don't even read music, but I know that that composer doesn't need musicians who read music. So then he wrote a piece for them and they've been playing that piece and they played play it in Louvre and they, they played it all around the world. So, you know, so that kind of uh, flexibility, I think, from curators uh, to think about different and new ideas of collaborations and new, you know, of course, with orchestra, without orchestra, but just like the whole idea of, of, of having um, people outside the classical world join us in a way. You made us very impatient to know bit more about tectonics. I'm not sure everyone knows exactly what it is. It is very special. Um, give us maybe a little, some, some more insights about what is tectonic, when did you found it and why and what it has become today. Thanks. Festival started uh, in Iceland so that's why the name tectonics because you have tectonic plates over there um, hitting each other and so the idea was from the about genres that hit each other that don't necessarily blend and what happens when you get given audience that interaction, you know? Um, so we have done uh, around 25, 26 projects uh, around the world since 2012 uh, in Glasgow. That's kind of the main base with the BBC Scottish where you in New York, in, in Onassis Center, in Athens, uh, in other places. So it's a collaborative project. So sometimes I have uh, co-curators working with me on this project uh, that are local and so that know the local scene more. 
and it's not only an international festival. So we have a lot of local musicians in every locality, but the idea is mainly having an orchestra as a base for the festival usually, not always, and then having a whole bunch of other kinds of music next to it. And also people writing their first orchestral piece uh, for this festival. They, some of them have never written a piece for orchestra before. That could be normal composers that just write normally chamber music, but that could be also people that learned, I mean, they, they've started from another genre altogether. So, uh, you know, and that led to other projects. Like for example, this summer I'm doing a commission by George Lewis uh, for the proms. And that came out of the collaborations that we've done uh, in tectonics and in, in, in Glasgow in general, like where I invited, I've been inviting people there since 2003 or four. To, to collaborate with the orchestra. So way before Tectonic started, we've already started doing this type of collaborations. Right, and Tectonics is something like three days long, yeah, if I'm right? Yeah, it's, a, it's usually a two, three day festival, like an intense period. We've done an online version this year, obviously in Glasgow. So this was in early May before concerts started. Um, and that, was, that seemed to work well. Um, I actually went to Glasgow, I made it over after quarantine and then I was able to, to work with the orchestra for the first time after like uh, 14 months. And so we recorded six pieces um, and some of them were premieres and uh, I tried to kind of work within the limitations of the BBC. So we get like two premieres usually per year, but I actually get way more because I approach a lot of artists that want to write pieces and they can also try to find other fundings. And so we usually have about 10 new pieces or eight or nine new pieces every year for orchestra. And about one or two of them are really from composers that never, composers or bands or, or musicians that have never worked with orchestra before. Right. And we had George Lewis, who's based in Berlin, was an Afro-American composer. We had him on a wonderful webinar we could organize with Barbara Anigan and several other people on, di on diversity. Thanks so much, Maestro. Um, Matthias, you have been in um, charge of, of the Reperban Festival, which was also some way kind of um, mixing best practices from different genres. And you have been, as I said, managing naive. You were a consultant to Deutsche Grammophon. So your best place to give us, like I did on, a, on the um, Tabitha did, my apologies, for um, I was. Uh, translating into German, your first name, um, and uh, on the artist management side to, to give us uh, uh, some more clarity on the, let's say, festival and label scene in Germany, please. Yes, yeah, um, thank you for the, for the introduction. So yeah, I was involved at, um, well, let's start different. Maybe Naive brought me to classical music about 15 years ago when I started to work on the classical catalog as well. And I worked on the pop catalog as well. And those was the first time I, I experienced that these two worlds during that time communicate too well together and I had totally different concepts of market album, as you said, to be the, like touring first and then releasing an album or the other way around and had the most funny discussions. So um, at Rapelbahn Festival, I years, six years ago, um, a B2B, um, part of the festival panel talks showcases classical artists meet pop artists and exchange on common topics i would say so where i can learn from the other um where interested pop musicians for example can can join a panel and and learn from classical and techniques about playing in, in, in the nice venues where even all these all the small little electronic and guitar bands they, they would love Royal Albert Hall and these nice classical places to have that decent atmosphere and to have that exchange but as I said mostly I found out um, it, it's still a bit separated so the, the barriers they're like melting away slowly um, set, thanks to the work of lots of management companies, uh, record labels who also approach classical music, music with a kind of pop marketing and the other way around as well. And I had one idea when you said, um, well, that's a theory of mine, 
Tabitha, when you said it's so important for artists nowadays to also present their personality, to um, to be out there, to be on social media, to interact with their fans, because I mean, years ago we had these discussions that um, the fan base of classical music is, is is becoming older and older, and there's no new ones um, coming. But this is also due to my opinion, um, a lack of communication to the young people. So, and how do you reach them? You reach them by social media. You reach them by personal stories, not made up marketing stories. I mean, real personal stories. And um, one, one point, one theory, maybe as a, um, as a little thing to discuss, I have the impression that playlists in general, algorithms on, on, on digital platforms, they kind of at first, in, in the first step, they take away the personality of, of, of artists because th these artists, if they're happy, uh, if they're lucky, they appear on playlists and, and they have a lot of a lot of clicks and create revenue. And but um, sometimes it's more background playlists like like our uh, uh, the, the most famous um, how's it called peaceful piano playlist. You don't you, you don't go in there and look for for the artist names. You just listen to it because it sounds nice, which 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 is positive. So I don't want to criti criticize it, but on the other hand, you have to compensate. Due to my, that's that's my theory, and and uh, present your artists even more than than you did in the past, and also yeah. make at the same time the connection to the younger generation as well. Can I counter in on that? Please. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we, we've, we've exactly found the same. The goal was about 18 months ago is playlisting, playlisting, playlisting. What playlisting can we get? Can we get on playlists? Can we get on Spotify's Piano Chill? I mean, of course we can. It guarantees 100,000 views overnight. Let's, sorry, listens overnight. It's wonderful. You get 17 pence. Thanks. <laughs> we won't go into the payment structures of Spotify right now. But um, one of the things that we are finding more and more important over playlisting is the DSP representation. Mm -hmm. So is it's about uh, we're bringing out a kind of quite a revolutionary album with the Taka Quartet and they're collaborating with a lot of electronic artists like Square Pusher and Toki Monster and Lewis Cole. And it's basically making sure that the artist gets on as a featured artist within that so that when you go to someone like Toki Monster, who has something like 2.5 million listens a month, you see a Taka Quartet's name alongside them. And we are seeing that actually in a very similar way to the way that video game music works actually as well in essence that young people listen to video game music without kind of understanding listen to classical music so we're trying to sort of pull them over or not even pull them over but just provide excellence in their space so the same with Ataka is we have actually seen that since their two singles have come out um, with the electronic artists we have seen their numbers nearly double on social media and we've seen their previous albums you know the, the numbers go up on that because people have then on apple you know added to library on spotify they have selected them as an artist so they're getting the alerts the playlisting is wonderful and i think it's a really um in my job i worked after very i looked after very very emerging talents and that was for them the perfect strategy to get in within the likes of the big, big pianists out there but now it's more about you know providing a service to the fans that are already out there and not really telling them this is classical music because often and some you know very contemporary classical music in the same playlist and you would assume it's the same album this kind of neoclassical post-classical genre is nigh on identical it's just that they're written in a different way the way that Elam was talking about it you know just because some people start on a laptop with in pro tools or somebody starts at a piano in the middle we meet and it sounds the same to the generally to the listener um I'm not necessarily convinced that every classical artist would like to think they're doing that but as managers and as labels and as press teams and marketing teams, we are essentially providing music to, the, to an, an already captive audience. We've just got to get ourselves in there, basically. So, That's yeah, play, I'm, I'm pro playlisting, but it's not it's not everything. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm totally too. So that there was no criticism. I'm just yeah, saying yeah, so yeah. There needs, there needs to be a counterweight on the other side. Fascinating. Um, maybe if I may be a little bit provocative, um, upon um, Matthias' remark that classical music fans' um, base is, is, is getting older and older. We learned um, uh, a month ago in the previous webinar from Chad Jenkins at Chart Metrics that he was telling us that much probably 
in the streaming audience, the classical music lovers are now becoming younger than the pop, uh, uh, let's say rock music. I mean, the, in, in the, the French way we understand rock music, you know, the French um, Springsteen, you see what I mean. Maybe, um, may I ask Romain, music, if it is one of the reasons why I believe music invested in, in Naive, the, 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 the French label, um, uh, and all its, its classical and pop operations. Uh, sure. Um, well, thanks. Uh, first of all, thanks to having me uh, with you today. Um, and B, I'm 100% agree with everything that just has been discussed specifically by Tabitha. 100% um, of what she said earlier and, and what she said about streaming and everything. Uh, and I feel there's, there's more and more collaboration and needs of uh, uh, genre to be mixed. If you look at the music today, it's going to be more and more, and, and historically speaking, it's going to be more and more difficult to invent things. Uh, so what is going to be the music tomorrow is actually people that will uh, be innovative enough um, and come with artistic proposition that will probably mix in a new way uh, existing music or existing ways of recording music, et cetera, et cetera. And if you look at what's happening today, this is exactly what we are uh, witnessing. Um, there's more and more... Uh, um, pop parties that are willing to collaborate with uh, classical uh, uh, musicians. There's more and more um, producers uh, that are, or, or artists that are willing to use classical musicians to present, to record, or to present on stage uh, what, what they do. And there's a lot of, um, even the media are asking us for that. If you look at France Inter in France, you know, and Radio France, they created uh, the hip hop symphonic and the hip hop symphonic, it's urban artists using an orchestra and, and proposing what uh, their, their, their songs with uh, in a totally different way. Uh, and, and what that brings it that it brings you like uh, another way to listen to the music, to expose the music, to play live the music and to reach different uh, audiences. Uh, artists are, are willing to collaborate as well. We, we are working with Kerenan and Kerenan new project is, is going to be recorded with Quatuor Debussy, uh, revisiting a repertoire. So there's there's a bunch and bunch of examples like this. Uh, rappers and hip hop uh, uh, artists are using samples from classical music, etc. The Affix Twin example is a, is a great example. I'm a huge fan of Affix Twin and I totally agree with that. Um, uh, even the way some of those artists are presenting their their uh, their work on stage, uh, I, I think is, is is going that that direction. The reason why we both naive to go back to your question is that uh, we feel that well, first this is in line with our mission, and our mission, I believe, is really to work with any type of artists and music and creators uh, in every music genres and to serve diversity and to try to um, the right partner for them. Uh, in a more and more and fast, fast developing, growing digital world. And we don't see any exceptions to this and certainly not with classical music. There's absolutely no reason why uh, the digital artist uh, or, or, or the audience that are liking to, uh, to, to listen to uh, classical music won't uh, discover and share and, and, and consume music uh, in, in the digital world, absolutely no reason. Uh, the COVID situation and, and what happened with, unfortunately, the physical uh, retailers being shut down, et cetera, showed that uh, there was a new generation of people uh, willing to come on the platforms and, and, and subscribe and discover, uh, uh, discover music, including classical music. So the reason why we both naive was like, A, this is a fantastic brand. B, they have a fantastic catalog, and C, we believe that um, there's a lot to be done in continuing developing the brand in signing the new generation of artists. And that new generation of artists are the artists that will become more and more uh, interested by the digital era and would probably get inspired by uh, some of the pop uh, artists in their way to produce music, to release music. Uh, uh, and, and to promote music, uh, meaning that uh, it's a question of um, um, rhythm in, in producing and, and releasing music. We see in the digital world that there's a prime in releasing music on a regular basis. 
which was not necessarily the case in the, not always the case in the classical world. Also, because you know it's not the same cast and musician, you know, to be in studio, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Still, some of the new generation understood that, and they are no longer willing to necessarily record albums, but are willing to understand what would what would it means for them to release singles or EPs. What would it mean to potentially, in some market, at least release them only uh, in digital? What does that mean? As um, Tabitha was saying about, hey, let's take care of our social network. Uh, uh, let's let's uh, let's share our music in in some other ways that we used to, etc., uh, etc. Et and we see that in the digital world, uh, the more you get connected with your audience, whether it's in releasing music or putting a new video out or engaging their audience or being on stage or collaborate with other type of artists to reach their audiences um, is a key factor of success, is a key factor of growing their audiences and is a key factor with the capacity to expose the music to a larger audience. What, what digital brings to the, to, the, to, the, um, to, to the picture here is the capacity of releasing music faster, cheaper and more globally. Um, I'm not talking about recording it cheaper necessarily, but releasing and exposing it uh, uh, for, for and test market. It's also about testing market in taking less risk. And, and that's what interesting. So in buying naive, uh, we made the bet that, uh, well, first we wanted to diversify our portfolio. Um, and on naive, there were the classical part, but also the jazz part and the world part and the pop part. Um, one of the most emblematic artists of naive pop is, is, is Jana Dead. And Jana Dead comes from the conservatoire. She, she comes from the jazz uh, world, but very interested in the classical part as well. So um, all those new generation of artists uh, are listening a lot of music. And when I'm, I'm talking to classical artists, they're also listening from, from some hip hop. Why? Because the way the, 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 some of the hip hop uh, artists use a classical sample. And, and vice versa. So there's a lot of connections. Uh, and I think that this, this is also going to be very interesting in the future uh, to, 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 um, to work with those, those artists and to also, A, try to find some bridges in the way they record music or in their capacity to release music on a more regular basis, but also um, in the way they are um, engaging their audiences. Uh, historically speaking, speaking, I think the best way for a classical artist to engage his audience was to tour, was to tour in festivals, etc., and, and to go and meet their audiences, and that was fantastic. And it still needs to happen that way, of course. Uh, uh, but 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 there's, there's many other ways, and live streaming, for example, and and we 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 we're going to do some stuff with an artist uh, uh, on a live streaming, like presenting an, an artist in, in a venue, in a famous classical venue, but also uh, uh, on, on live streaming as well. And that can help us you know, to, to reach a wider audience. Uh, and, and, and again, um, we are in a, in a discovery way, in, in a discovery mode. People are eager to listen, to, 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 uh, to discover more music. They are very curious. And as everything is available any, anywhere, anytime through the digital platform that is accelerating the capacity of making uh, um, uh, artists to be discovered or to help people to discover new music. Um, there's a big fight that I'm, that I'm having right now with, uh, not a big fight, but let's say like a, 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 a big discussions with the, uh, with the platforms, because I don't think they are um, giving us enough um, contact or chances or people to talk to about classical music. If you look at the DSPs, I have 10 people to talk to in France, in Germany, in the UK, everywhere about urban music and electronic music. 10 people for each DSPs, right? Uh, I have tons of opportunities to have them spend some money of my biggest people parties. When it comes to classical music, it's one person at Spotify for Europe, one person at Apple. They're a great person. We love them. We work very well with them, but it's just not enough. We need more people to talk to about classical music or jazz music. And we need those people uh, to help us figure it out. Uh, how can we expose better our artists on the platform? Not only on the playlist, but also from a partnership standpoint, from an editorial standpoint, from a marketing standpoint, uh, and, and to build bridges with, with other genres. Because there's no reason why people that are liking pop music, 
if we are presenting the right way at the right time uh, as some classical artists, they won't like classical artists. Uh, uh, so, I, and, at, and at least we should try. And, that, and that's really what we need to do. Fascinating. Thank you, Roma. My, my, my. And I'm taking some notes to ask the most relevant questions afterwards, and I couldn't um, have enough uh, velocity to pick up, uh, due to the density of your of your um, arguments. We will come back to some of them for sure. I'm sure, Luc, as we were now listening to Romain saying the new generation of classical artists or artists inspired by, in some way, by pop habits had uh, um, um, at least uh, releasing and producing and promoting their, um, their music. I'm sure that resonates very much with uh, how you decided to enter the market a couple of years ago. Um, your um, um, uh, learning curve, let's say so, and what you have already achieved. Please give us in, in, in some uh, sentences a, a self-portrait of uh, how you really peculiarly and, and uh, in a very individual way, you decided to, um, to, to start your, your, your career and, and make uh, out of yourself the pianist you are today. Sure thing. Uh, well, it was entirely a practical reason, actually, why I got into the online scene. Um, well, I, I live in the countryside. I live in Shropshire. It's very green and scenic and beautiful, but unfortunately not very good for getting places. Um, so obviously, as a classical pianist, the touring thing wouldn't have been ideal, especially because I didn't have a driving license until I was relatively old. Um, so basically, getting into the online scene seemed like the obvious way to go if I could sort of try and make some money from it somehow. Um, but the way it started was actually entirely serendipitous. Um, I'd been recording this, working towards recording this quite difficult piece. It was um, a transcription by Brassan of um, Wagner's Ride of the Valkyries. So it was very, very difficult, hands crossing, lots of things going on. And I spent about six hours practicing that piece. And at the end of it, I was sort of thinking, gosh, that was quite intense. I sort of just wanted to relax. And I ended up improvising a piece that would become daydreaming, um, which is my first piece I ever uploaded online. That was back in the start of 2017. And um, I figured I quite liked the piece. I mean, it was very simple. It was sort of like um, what Matthias had said, actually, about Aphex Twin, um, how they're obviously like pop, but then sort of wrote Avril 14th, I think it's called, this sort of great piano piece. And there are plenty of examples of that, actually, from people from the pop world coming over to sort of the neoclassical piano world. I mean, Evgeny Grinko is uh, an artist I particularly like. He's a Russian composer. I think he was originally a, a drummer for a punk band, but then ended up sort of writing piano music. And he wrote a piece called Vault, which is massively popular. Um, so it's interesting how they came from sort of the pop sphere to the sort of neoclassical middle, middle ground. And I sort of started in the classical sphere and went to the sort of the neoclassical ground as well from that angle. And stage dreaming is in that sort of ilk, I guess. It, it's a similar sort of style. It's sort of simplified, quite chilled. Um, anyway, so I stuck it on YouTube and I had no label representing me. There was nothing like that going on. Um, I basically just put it on there and thought, right, I'm Luke Fortford from Shropshire. No one knows me. No one has a clue who I am. How am I going to sort of uh, alert people that my music's online and to sort of go and search for me? Um, so I started sort of really interacting with the with the community. I mean, very much as Tabitha said, actually, you know, it's all it's all about creating that sort of public persona online using social media to sort of try and build your own audience and community quite a lot. And I think I got 55 subscribers in my first day of doing that. And um, even so, I mean, I was sort of thinking about leaving music at that point and going into finance. In fact, uh, I remember at the end of 2017, start of 2018, um, I'd got about 5,000 subscribers at that point. So it was, it was pretty good. Um, but obviously it wasn't earning me like a decent income at that point. <clears throat> so I was doing an internship at a hedge fund actually in, in London. And in the morning before work, I just spent just doing like hacking on YouTube. I, I made a, a spreadsheet because of course people in finance love spreadsheets. So I was no different. So I basically made a list of the um, videos on YouTube that had more than a million views. I didn't really think about it at the time as over a million views is a fairly easy metric to work with. Uh, so I made a spreadsheet and basically for an hour every morning before work, I would just sort of go through that spreadsheet um, saying, come and check out my music on my YouTube channel. I've written something in a style of Chopin, so I'm sure you'll enjoy it or something like that. And I did that for like an hour every day. And oddly enough, um, 
I ended up commenting without meaning to on Halodon, uh, which is one of the biggest YouTube channels for classical music. I ended up commenting on tons of their videos because they have so many Chopin videos of over a million views. I think they're actually distributed by Believe, actually, so Remain would know them well. Absolutely. But, um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so basically I was sort of spamming their, their comment section every day, and I must have been giving their social media guy a massive headache. Um, but they actually called me uh, about a month into this, um, I was sitting in this office in London. It was a great internship, but at the same time, you know, I had this email from Halodon saying, yeah, we actually, we like what you're doing. Would you be interested in doing some recordings for us? And I thought, yes, I can get back into music. Uh, so I did. So I, um, you know, as soon as the inter internship finished, I went back to Shropshire and started practicing quite a lot again and recording lots and lots of music. I think I did like 10 albums for Halodon in the first year. And through collaborating with them, that's more and more subscribers to my own channel and I kept writing this sort of neoclassical stuff because for Halodon I was doing primarily classical um, but I was still writing quite regularly um, you know basically three weeks I'd be uploading something new and sharing something new so of course the, the following was sort of growing all the while and eventually I started other platforms like Spotify and came across as Matthias said the peaceful piano playlist which is very popular <clears throat> and um, I got lucky basically. Um, I ended into peaceful, planets, uh, peaceful Piano twice. I got into piano in the background. Basically, all of the big Spotify playlists I've gone to. In fact, I think um, I've got a track on Peaceful Piano right now. Um, so my, my response to all of this, to basically playlists uh, and sort of trying to build my numbers and sort of trying to make more revenue from the neoclassical piano world is basically what Tabitha is saying. It's um, trying to have that relationship with your listeners. And that's why I really like YouTube, because YouTube has a comments section. You can go and reply to people. You can go and say, you know, thanks for your comments, you, you know, all the rest of it. And I try to do that. I mean, it takes quite a long time. I think I've had like 2,000 comments on daydreaming alone. So replying to all of those many hours, <laughs> whatever. It's worth doing because you get a strong relationship. Your followers like you more, and they're more likely to go into interact with your content in the future. Um, so yeah, so basically I'm sort of trying to build YouTube just because you can have that sort of valued relationship with your audience and they're more likely to buy your sheet music for example or to share or whatever um, and that basically feeds back into the Spotify thing as well because I have links that direct people to Spotify uh, so yeah I mean that's basically my story and um, now I do that writing lots of compositions for Spotify and for the rest of it I'm doing lots more recordings for Hallad coming out next year now um, written more compositions um, I'm trying a certain events. I'm still doing those sort of style pieces quite regularly, um, but I'm sort of trying to do something that's more back to what I was originally doing, the sort of thanks to um, Jan Tears and sort of style, I guess. So there you go, that's my story. <laughs> Thanks. Fascinating. Now comes the harsh part for me because it looks very much like we have new world and a kind of fairy tale what we were now discussing for the last in the last 45 minutes it looks like okay things are converging mm. there's great literature for classical okay, we'll have a, a capacity to monetize and to engage the audience but I, i'm i if i remember well i think Sweeney, that guy who composed great with great ears already 25 years ago but he's also doing very harsh video clips if i remember very well uh, how can you compose the ones you're commissioning at tectonics for instance ilan how can they compete with affix twin i mean um in a world which is dominated by um pictures how can you compete with uh, it's, it's it's in some way it's uh, you know your home studio competing with marvel studios i take another example which is probably a caricature too uh, uh, we have all heard that uh, Apple and Amazon will switch to hi-fi quality, which was uh, pretty much kind of monopole in some way for higher uh, paid subscriptions uh, by, for instance, a French uh, web st streaming service like Cobus. So how can um, the classical music world, which was pretty much a world in which people appreciated listening to great quality sound and to the, uh, I don't know, complete series of Karajan, uh, of Beethoven symphonies three times by Karajan and maybe some solo by David Gilmour live, but you know, very tiny part. How can we compete in a world in which everyone will have access for cheap money to such a high quality sound? Is that not something which takes something from our identity? So maybe first question to Eden. You understand my point is there are also a lot of threats 
and I optimistic. Well, it's by a name. big, it's yeah. it's a big question, um, and uh, I would I think one thing that came up to be while you guys were talking, and then Luke started talking, and said, ah yes, Luke plays his own music. <laughs> Okay, I think it's one point to mention from the classical side. I think we need to make a distinction there. It's not actually answering your question, Eric, but I think it's relevant. Luke plays his own music and it's really crucial because a taka quartet or somebody else playing somebody else's music, that's very different. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, if it's Arvo Pert who has become like huge because it's his music, you never seen Arvo Pert playing his music, right? There is no need for him to like, you don't need Arvo Per to play. He's got his music going, you know, and it's huge. And uh, not that I'm a, a huge Arvo Per fan, but, but it's, it, I think the issue there is a lot about composing. And I think we as classical people in the industry, I think we really need to push the composers and we need to kind of hold on a little bit about the performers. I, I love them, it's like I'm a performer, but uh, I actually think we need to concentrate much more about the composing side mm. and try to understand how we can actually promote that. Mm. You know, because to be honest, we have already the recordings of, I mean, the old repertoire, all of the old repertoire, except if it's unknown repertoire, has been recorded mm. superbly, at least twice, sometimes 20 times, mm. okay? Sometimes more. If you talk about Karajan, Beethoven symphonies, we have at least 20 amazing cycles of Beethoven, you know, from in amazing quality, whatever you want. You know, you can, you can argue which one you like, like when you go to a really posh supermarket, you can compare the tomatoes on here and here. But, you know, is there a need for it? But we need new music, whatever genres it is. You know, my, I mean, my festival, it's a small fry thing. We, I mean, the biggest thing that we ever did was Cassandra Miller cello piece, which, which kind of became a cult piece. And then it got released on another timbre and it got tons of uh, good reviewed and, and in a very small circle of world, because for example, another timbre is not on Spotify, uh, in a very small circle of, of classical music and, and new music, people love that piece. And it's become a kind of cult piece. And I think in 10 years, it will become huge but it will take time because that label doesn't want to be, to be going into Spotify. They're not interested in one and a half million views on YouTube. So there are many ways here. Like we don't always need to think about, oh, we need to have huge amount of money. Like we need to make sure that there's a lot of music and we need to also support the small things, you know, because I, I believe in the small venues, in the small festivals, I, I believe that that's where without these small venues, without the small festivals, Without the music that's only for 10, 20 people, we can't live. Like if you just want to have only this big stuff, that's fine, but we need to make sure the small stuff remains. And I have a lot of criticism about how venues are run. You know, like you open a huge venue and you don't make sure that the small venue can be used for the local musicians because it's too expensive. Like it costs 500 euro to rent, which sounds like nothing, but for these people, they can't get 500 euro. They don't have 500 euro. You know, so you, you open Harpa, it's huge, it's amazing, but you don't have a music program. You don't have a proper music program. You don't have planning, you don't have budget for planning. So I worry about that. I worry about the fact that we, we don't support what's local around us. We don't, like, we, we need to make sure. That's another theme, but we, I, I feel like we are very disconnected with that on a local basis. And then this is part of what I try to do with the festival. Like we try to make sure that, okay, let's call up this guy who lives five minutes from here. He's never worked with the orchestra for some, I mean, for some reason. So let's give him a chance. I mean, I'll give you an example, last example, like this New York Philharmonic. You know how many commissions in the last 50 years New York Philharmonic did from composers that live five blocks away? They just don't do it. You have, uh, they, they commission Ligeti, they commissioned, not Ligeti, Lindbergh, they commissioned uh, a lot of uh, Scandinavian composers, whatever the conductor that comes brings some European composers, but New York is full of composers. You can have a season only of New York composers and they, and they are not there, they're not played there. And there is a huge problem there, you know, with how we, how we approach our, our live scene. You know, I am not an expert in, in social media or anything. I have a very small uh, Facebook site, which is like open 
and then mostly private for the 5,000 friends that are there. And then, and then I don't have Instagram and I don't have Twitter, so I'm very bad at this. But, um, but I do feel that there is space for the small stuff that we don't have to compete with. with uh, we, we need to create space for the small, you know, and, and the great thing about doing this uh, um, streaming events in the last year has been that you can see that your audience is not only 50 people or 200 people or 500 people in the locality. It's 10,000 or 20,000 around the world, mm -hmm. you know, people that are interested in, in kind of more experimental, more new music. You know? And it could be much bigger if you do the proper work online, you know, if you, if you actually work properly on your website and your promotion. May, may I, uh, these, I have the feeling that that new philosophy of think local and act global, thanks to the digital tools, is pretty much what led Matthias to building 30M records, uh, or, or may I be mistaken about that? You were telling me you have a fantastic Persian Iranian community in Hamburg. I was telling you yes. as we were preparing the show last week that we know how vibrant the Parisian scene is with Iranian mm -hmm. entrepreneurs, even in classical music. Uh, welcome here, Asha Kant uh, from Antesco for Metronaut. We have a fantastic entrepreneurship here in France. Um, so tell us about that. Yeah, maybe just to, to come back. So there were, were two points I found really interesting by um, um, Ilan and, and Roman as well. So about the uh, composing part, about the new things out there, about the openness of people to, to dive into different sound worlds, discover new music, to discover new unique music as well. So, and I worked with a couple of artists for, for, um, for, for my um, customers. I, I worked with Olaf, for example, who is very strong in, in composing as well. I worked on the other hand with um, Polini or Zimmerman or, or Elaine Grimaud, the last, the last album, which is a different storytelling because it's a different, it's, it's different repertoire. It's different. One is yeah, it's com composed, the other one is perf perf performed. And I wanted to add something, um, well, not own um, to this, but also make people discover new music. So I founded a label for music from contemporary music from Iran uh, last year. So with all eight, and I, I love to bring worlds together. I love exchange of uh, people exchanging from classical, from pop, from Iran, from Western, uh, from the Western community. So uh, yeah, that's my new mission, which started as a hobby, which became quite uh, time intense. So we just, we're just preparing our third release. Second release was a compilation called This is Tehran, question mark, astonishment. Um, really? So 10 contemporary artists with Iranian classical instruments, with uh, new instruments, electronics. Beats and um, yeah, I think it's a, it's 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 an excellent time at the moment. So pe people are really actively looking for new music. Um, societies are changing, are more polarizing in a, in a political or social way, but also opening up and, and look to, looking to to uh, other continents and um, coming back to the composing part. So I, I really try to tell the stories of music out there background, it's, it's a social background, it's a political background, it's an, a, like a long um, history, a long uh, history of, of, of music in Iran and the different um, instruments. And I just found it, it just happened to me. I didn't look for it. So I traveled a lot to that country in the past five years and uh, met a lot of great musicians. But I found this is unique music played on about a unique instrument, new instrument that people in, in the West wouldn't know about. And it, it's unique stories. And, and this is great to tell because you have these uh, communities, you have Los Angeles, London, Paris, uh, all everywhere you have of, um, Iranian um, immigrants from the past 20, 30 years. So they use social media intensively. Instagram is huge the exchange via Instagram and producing, coming back to the marketing, producing the right tools for Instagram, producing clips for YouTube, uh, the message on Twitter, doing the same Facebook and, and trying to connect everything and make, make um, things. So that's 
a bit what what we were just discussing like in a little small um how you call this if it's really um comprom um Um, thing. What's there, there's an expression for this, but I can't find it in English. Rita, you can help here or look. Microcosm. N native speakers. Microcosm. Thank you, thank you. Microcosm. So it's it's a microcosm which kinds of reflects all of this on a on a small scale. Yes. May I ask you? Do you have a marketing strategy for picking up one of these composers and make out of him the in legacy of our times? We, we, I mean, we're in early stages, so so I'm I'm talking to artists. I'm, I'm I signed the first the first two artist deals with the label, so and now comes development and uh, defining and maybe talking about the the strong point or the unique points about about all of this to to develop it further, make make them make these great artists tour as soon as possible. After COVID and after maybe the the sanction period has has a bit a bit been a bit eased, uh, so and then I will yeah do all what I learned till today to 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 make them become the Ludovic or the whoever of of, of Iran in their own terms. Great. May, may I come to a pain point? and to um, that uh, payment structure because Tabitha you were telling okay Stuart is getting great I, I we imagine he can of like mechanic in the 60s or late 60s or late 70s with Liverpool about you but what about all these young artists you were mentioning who had to pay for a press attaché for a digital attaché looking at uh, looking good etc we have I, I don't, I mean, well, maybe I'm not experienced enough in our industry, but I don't have the feeling that even big agency like Harrison Paris and Polyans are able to make prepayments of thousands of pounds to such artists. Generally. So how does it, um, and the same question maybe to Oma um, for the new signatures of Naive, because it's pretty much kind of similar problem. And this is where Roman will probably shake his head at me. We. Generally, in an album cycle, I like to cut a good deal <laughs> where a lot of the costs regarding, regarding press and digital support are offlaid to the label, especially if it's within, within the label cycle. But also, um, I mean, and this is a, a business convergence with pop and classical as well, is that generally, myself as a classical manager, I book live, I manage everything. On the pop side, there is generally a manager who manages over, who generally manages strategy and all the big stuff. And then they have a booking agent solely for live. I manage at the moment, uh, a, a few, a lot, many artists, I manage about 17. And some I'm the agent for, some I'm not. Um, I have a booking agent. I have different agents in different territories, depending on the artist and the specialty they need. Um, but sometimes the way I sell it into my artist is I'm going to work my damned hardest to make sure that their live fees mean that they can pay the mortgage, support their families and, you know, pay and pay the management commission. And then from that, we say, OK, let's keep back 500 euros from this one and let's put that into a stylist for a photo shoot. So it's part of my overall budgeting of their annual income for the year and say, actually, this is an investment back into you. If you were to support this, you would see tenfold the money back on 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 spot of, on YouTube, for example, you know that's a really that's a really good one that you can see trends in the way that Google pay out monthly on AdSense. You know you can earn very quickly once you get over sort of five million views. So that's kind of my managerial point to to try and not let them spend too much money, but also remind them that you know it's an it's an investment back and they can claim it back on taxes and everything. So yeah, but and romance probably um, I deal with naive quite a lot with two of my artists and they're probably saying that. <laughs> I'm pushing them on press targets and budgets. So. No, no I, I, you know, on, on that one, I will be, and I, I am always very pragmatic. And this is what we do for classical artists, but for any artist. What we uh, need and want to understand and the way I'm, uh, I'm engaging every conversation and ask my team to engage every conversation, it's really about uh, who are you? What do you do? How are you structured? What can you do well? What can't you do well, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, 
we, we need to understand uh, the, uh, it, it's really about understanding the needs uh, of the artist and how uh, well is the structure, what can, he, what can he finance, what can't he finance. Uh, uh, and, and the answer depends sometimes, not only from one artist to another, obviously, but for single artists from one country to another. So sometimes he, there's things he would do well or could do well uh, or invest in with his team um, in his own market, but not uh, in other market internationally. And this is where uh, we need to provide more than in, in his local market. So uh, it, 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 it's, it's, and of course it will have to, um, to be currently balanced, you know, from a contractual standpoint and an economic standpoint. So that the risk and rewards are, are, are balanced between us and, and the artist. But um, definitely what I see is that, and, and going back to what was discussed earlier, is that we really need to think about where the money should go. Because until the classical music will, uh, will um, or for some of the projects that are already mainstream, uh, and, and, and some of those are, are, are mainstream already, but uh, and until you know, we would have compensated the, the decrease of the physical with a larger audience on, on digital, which is going to become more and more international. We need to be careful about where we invest money. My my gut sense is is that there's no reason why what happened in the pop world should not happen in, in the classical world, meaning that we need to invest more in content, uh, and and content to me and audiovisual content to start with is, is the first marketing and promotion. It's the first marketing and promotion to invest in because it's to, it's 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 your biggest capacity to uh, to develop content to reach out to um, to have argument with the DSPs and the media to talk about you to expose you to develop your brand to reach audiences etc. So have the right content, and if you have the right rhythm to release that content, half or two thirds of your marketing and promotion is done, uh, and then it's about leveraging the right way to expose pose those content the best way, whether it's with promotion or marketing. But at, at least if you have something to, to deliver to the DSPs or to the media and YouTube, I'm 100% agree with what Luke said on YouTube. YouTube is a fantastic platform, uh, which allows us to do many things that we were not able to do in the past. Most of the people are seeing YouTube as a, a poor way of and you know, there's been all these discussions a few years ago about the value gap, et cetera, which is still somehow going on. But I, we never, we never saw YouTube as, as only a, a way to monetize music. We saw YouTube about, of course, a way to monetize music, but a media, the best chances to expose your content because exposing your content on TV, well, good luck. Um, and and so it's it's definitely a, a media on top of being a monetization platform, but it's also a commercial platform on which exactly has Luke, Luke says you can you can do some links on your concert tickets, on your merchandising, or your CDs, etc., on your vinyl, and it's a CRM platform out of which you take uh, a lot of data, you know your audience better, you engage your audience better. And you can replicate that with absolutely everything. You can replicate that with Facebook, with TikTok. And there's no reason why classical music should not become a trend at some point on, on TikTok as well. If I look at my daughter, you know, I have two daughters and it's a um, continuum study at home for me uh, uh, with those two uh, and, they're, and they're 13 and 16 years old. And I'm amazed by the way uh, uh, they are discovering music. And they don't care where it comes from. They just care about if they like it or not. And from a sync on a TV series, it can come from a TikTok trend. It can come from Facebook. It can come from YouTube. It can come from a friend, whatever. And they're just rediscovering music from the 70s and the 80s because somehow those are exposed differently to a younger generation. And if it's classical music, that's fine. And her uh, plays piano and she plays classical music. And, and, and that's great because, you know, and she's not really willing to play pop music. She's, she's happy with playing classical music and or cross. And Jan Tiersen, for example, she plays Jan Tiersen stuff. So, so that, that, that's really about what it is. So going back to the investment, we need to A, understand what the artist needs and, and where he needs our help, whether it's on investment, on expertise, on people on the ground, or uh, explaining what the digital market is about, et cetera, et cetera. 
and, and then leveraging all those new ways of exposing music. Because if you look at the ecosystem right now, there's much more ways to expose music than before. It's different, it's technical, sometimes difficult, sometimes not really uh, well done for classical artists, but much more opportunities and cheaper opportunities. So how do we make that as an advantage to expose new artists and classical artists? That, that, that's the point. And, and I think more, it, it has to go in, in, in back to everyone has said earlier, it's about music. It's, 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 it's about uh, going back to the roots of producing music and, and um, making that, bringing that music to people. Um, and 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 uh, how do we say uh, excite their curiosity about discovering new artists uh, and and making collaboration so they can see that as you said earlier there's not a huge difference between a classical and a fixed twin or a, a, a Jan Tiersen and a classical artist etc cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, again the the right proposal to the right artist and us at Naive either it's an artist deal or a license deal or a distribution deal we are fine with this no problem we will do whatever makes the most sense for the artist and with the new generation of artists we see that they want to be more in control they still need more expertise they still need at some point us to help them for some stuff or to finance some stuff which is fine but they want to be in control of their master and on the way they are releasing music and where they spend their money and and that's great and and i think and actually this is a criteria for us a criteria of signing artists are new generation that are more into an entrepreneurial way of seeing their uh, their career as an artist and and willing to engage with their audiences through multiple forms of of of, of media in the digital world thanks thanks I, um, can, I can confirm that because we've just signed a deal with naive in that exact way <laughs> it's a premium distribution deal with a heavy emphasis on digital content it's wonderful that's very, um, we have, we love breaking news with Francoise in this webinar. This is uh, I, <laughs> an artist manager is congratulating the label. We never heard <laughs> that. Um, so now look, without disclosing industrial and personal secrets, um, are you working with other people? Do you have partners taking care of your CRM? Um, do you have people taking care of your style? Did you, did you discuss <laughs> with people about your jacket today morning with us? Uh, 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 tell us a bit more about, how, how you how you work how you you create value sure absolutely well actually um i even got me sort of thinking uh, when he mentioned about composers and how i've got the advantage that i play my own works um and of course composers like they, they have a, a more difficult time of it and I, and I think he's absolutely right when it comes to social media i think because social media sort of requires that you are uploading on a regular basis that you are putting out the content as remain said i think when you're like me, I, I'm, I'm in a really good position because I'm a pianist, I can play the piano, I compose, I've invested a bit of money in good microphones, I bought some DPA, so quite expensive, but really worth the price. Um, I've got, I basically, I, I've spent quite, a, like, I've been spent a lot of money on sort of great kits. So I've got a nice sort of cinema camera, decent lenses, preamps, lots of microphones and all the rest of it. And that was, that was it, but now I've got all the equipment so I can basically make content as much as I want to. I mean, this weekend I'm going to record 13 pieces. Um, the week after I'm going off somewhere else with a Starmay Model D to go and record, uh, I think another six pieces. And basically it just means my cost of creating content are incredibly low, which means that I can upload really regularly. I, like, I do once every three weeks and that's maintenance mode. I'm currently, building up a massive back catalog. So I can actually stop focusing on making the content and start focusing on actually promoting it, which of course is the main part of the battle, which I've sort of been neglecting for the past year, if I'm quite honest with you. Um, but back, back to what Ivan said, I mean, composers are at a disadvantage because you need to find people to play your work. So you're gonna to have to pay them. You're gonna have, I mean, if you've got a recording equipment, you're still gonna pay for the venue and all the rest of it. It's gonna cost quite a lot of money. And, I think getting to have rehearsal time and all the rest of it. So I think if, for a composer to go and basically um, upload something every three weeks, it's, which is roughly like sort of the industry standards, do something every three weeks, that's going to be very, very difficult for composers. So I think it's going to be interesting to see how the industry unfolds in the next 10 years or so in who's, who are the winners and who are the losers. 
And I think that there does need to be some sort of attention paid to composers who haven't got the advantage of just being like a soloist who can play their own stuff, but ones who write for other ensembles and sort of require a greater sort of gestation period before they can actually put something out. And I think his attention, his idea of, um, not Ivan's idea of basically um, locally grown stuff, having lots of festivals and actually making compensating for maybe their sort of disadvantage in the digital scene sort of compensating for that in the live scene is a very sensible approach to it um but i think some innovation on the part of digital service platforms to go and sort of try and foster young talent in the composition scene i also on that i think that if, if we were to think about what a composer's role is with, with regard with in relation to kind of our discussion about pop and pop and classical it's for me, with composers that are in commissioning cycles where we have, you know, huge, where we have orchestras and chamber groups and everything approaching them for com um, commissions, it's our responsibility as supporters of those artists to make sure that they're relevant to what's going on now, because that's where the synergy between pop and classical can really actually find, uh, you know, it can meet in the middle. We should all be influenced by the same things, which is what is happening in your immediate environment. You know, you, we're going to be finding a lot of pieces that aren't just symphony number 12. It's going to be very much affected by what's happened politically recently, obviously health recently, uh, obviously the, the huge rise in the Black Lives Matters movements, it being Pride Month. The fact that, we're, you know, Tyler, the creator and a, uh, a, a classical orchestra will probably ask, will be, uh, uh, you know, Tyler the Creator will be talking about something like this and an orchestra have approached us, for example, to for an artist to write about very similar things. It's then the responsibility of the orchestras, promoters, management, artists, to be ensuring that the root of the inspiration is related to the audiences in a way that makes hopefully non-classical listeners think, oh, actually, this is actually completely relevant to me. It's not an opus 313 that doesn't make any sense. I don't know what a BWB number is, for example. Like, it, what what is music now and how can we take that idea from pop over to classical pre-recording just in a concert sense and um, that's kind of hopefully something that I think is changing as well the fact that we can contextualize where inspiration comes from probably haven't spoken about that very well I'm fathoming things <laughs> and, 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 and fully agree and and I'm a huge fan of Tyler anything that you would be involved with I would personally want to listen to yeah, and and I'm sure I'm not the only one in that case. So it's a perfect example. I, okay, you I can get high pop art and high classical art, and they generally are going to be sourced from the same inspiration pool. I think I think you have convinced me, even a, 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 a French sceptic. And <laughs> so uh, maybe the very last last point. Um, um, Matthias, if I'm right, you put people like Olaf Werner, as great artist, to Tehran couple of years ago, Charles Jenkins against him, um, um, again, he was telling us in the last webinar that one of the best strengths of classical music is that it is a metropolitan factor. It interests people in Tehran, but also in Mexico City, in Jakarta. He was naming cities where apparently a percentage of people listening to solo piano playlists, et cetera, is, is higher than in New York City, Los Angeles, or Berlin, and Ciudad de Mexico, Jakarta, I was naming them. Okay, so how can we put the naive artists, your artists, Alisa, uh, look, uh, tectonics, how can we export, I don't like really the word, but you know, um, uh, it to audiences, um, Santiago de Chile, Southeast Asia, of course, Africa, Middle East, how can we compare where human beings are? What would be your strategy? And if you were a Bundeskultur, Stiftung, National Arts Council, or Centre National de la Musique, how would you, would you support it? You have 14 minutes for this. <laughs> to make a governmental plan, how to put classical music and artists through the wide world and have people, the whole humanity, benefiting benefiting of its uh, huge artistic and cultural values. Maybe Matthias, if you can start, because you have been pioneering this. I can try to, maybe maybe we can all get, get a couple of bits together for this. So um, it depends, of course, a bit on the on the local cultures where you want to go. So first I, I would, would need to have a look at the, the local structures, the local culture, taste. Um, and see if it if it would fit, if it could, could raise interest and maybe as a first step if i'm not really sure either you are a star abroad 
So then it's relatively easy because you see people want to buy tickets. You have streaming figures from, from the different territories. You have statistics where you can look at, okay, okay this will work. So this will, will be some. Um, but if, if this would be maybe not too clear, or if you go to, to new um, countries where you, where, where you haven't, or cultures where you haven't uh, played, performed, were not successful before, I would look, for example, for local collaboration. So let's 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 say a composition. What I experienced, for example, um, and I mean this this is happening everywhere. So you've got you go to a concert from X Y Z, like um, classical artists, and then you have the commissioned pieces played played afterwards or played before. Um, or um, I saw in, for example, so they um, invited. Pianists, classical pianists from from the West, and there was a um, well known um, well known national composer, or Iranian composer, joining joining for at the on the itself or were West musicians at the end of the concert or in the beginning of the concert, so that one um, well known figure is introducing the. So that's something they could compose pieces together, develop new, new, new content, um, maybe um, document it, maybe travel together, maybe play, uh, maybe travel to the one or the other country, um, make, establish more connection in terms of yeah, collaboration, a real collaboration. So that would be my first thoughts for this. Ilan, maybe? And I would go a completely opposite way before thinking about how to make some Europeans successful in Asia. I'm actually thinking the other way. For me, it's more important that we concentrate on actually bringing them over here. Because if, if you even look on, let's say, you know, what uh, George Ruiz was talking about in Darmstadt, you know, uh, you know how many African composers, Afro-American composers were played in Darmstadt, you know, got less than a hand. And so, and uh, I think uh, on all genres, I'm more interested in thinking about actually what we can, we can bring over here. We have the finance. I'm sorry, so, uh, mm -hmm. just, just, just to say, so that was meant in, in mm -hmm. both ways. Yeah, yeah, no, I understand. I understand, so not, no, I mean, the collaboration with, just... with local, I mean, that's the best way of doing this work. So that's, we, we, I've done that many, many times in the localities, you know, bringing somebody over to Iceland or to Israel or to Athens and have the collaboration there and making a new collaboration happen because of the visit of someone, you know, somebody's visiting, but actually he's, he's or she's interacting with the local scene and that creates something new, a new spot. Uh, and I, I think what we need to make sure in Europe uh, uh, and in the States is to make sure that our, we actually represent the whole world. We are, we are not only thinking about sending us to be successful everywhere, but actually we make sure our, our, when we talk about classical music, even straight classical music, uh, what is that? You know, do we know what that is? Like, or do, what's the best pieces from the last hundred years? Who decides that? Maybe there are many pieces that we've missed from many, many locations. And to do that research deeply, I feel that that's really missing. Uh, I can say that on classical, um, classical world, I feel there's a big, uh, lack of that and I, I think we need to I mean it's starting now but I think we have a big uh, way to go to understand these localities that, that uh, Matthias was talking about that's so important when you send somebody abroad you know when you want to be known in Indonesia you need to know about Indonesia um, and so there is a big opportunity there for us now uh, while it lasts and soon we won't be able to travel so let's use this time before we can stop flying people around uh, to, to, to actually really bring people over and for us to learn about what this is, you know, whether it's you know, Indonesian noise music or whether it's gamelan music or whether it's a shadow a theater from Indonesia, you know, every culture is this huge thing that we think we know about, we, but we don't. So we have a huge way to learn, I think, about these cultures and, 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 and also give opportunities for people. And that's, of course, I'm sure you had this discussion with, with the Georgian and other people, but it's a, it's, a, it's a long road there, I feel. 
and and we can use pop music for that because pop music can be a sort of you know I, I don't call it pop but any music that's not classical that's whether it's jazz or or it's or, or or noise or dance music or where what, what is a non-classical world you know coming in to a high profile you know Albert Hall or proms or whatever you want to I think there's a huge opportunity there for us and I think a lot of venues are doing that so I think it's, it's coming I just just wanted to make clear so that we should understand ourselves as local as well so if if there's visits from abroad coming here and not understand uh, the, the Western or the European uh, culture as, as global. So that's that's my, my most important point because that's what I realized as well when I was traveling to other countries and cultures that I always took our classical music as uh, uh, classical music. So uni um, international as a, as a thing which works everywhere and which sounds the same everywhere because I didn't think about it before. So that's a bit more than 20 years ago. So and then I understood, okay, there's local classical music as well without being folk, you know, so. I mean, this is where one of the problems of talking a center for music, whether it's in London or whether it's in Palestine, what is that for? You know, are we actually doing a center for music or are we doing a center for classical music, mm -hmm. for Western classical music? And we have to be really, we really have to dig, ask ourselves questions about that, I think. You know, the Center for Music, for example, for LSO, it's not going to happen. But if you talk about uh, Ramallah and Barenboim in Palestine with Said, this project is only classical music. Is that good enough or not? I, I have serious doubts about many of these projects. Um, Romain, maybe how do you think we could use some taxpayers' money in France for Centre National de la Musique to promote these exchanges, Matthias and Ilan were talking about? Well, yes, of course. Uh, I, I, if, if I look at the numbers of Naive, uh, we do 75% of our revenue outside of France, both from our physical and digital revenue. So it's very, very significant. And it's actually more significant than in any other genre. Um, the, the, the problem that we have uh, is that those 75% are made with tiny bits of money from many different territories, uh, of course, some of them are coming from the biggest classical market and the biggest musical market anyway. So Germany, UK, US, China now, and Italy and a few others, Japan, uh, of course. Um, I, I, I think what we need to do, and this is really something that we could work together, CNM and NS maybe, is that, um, is how can we leverage better uh, the data that we have so that each assessment uh, is on uh, properly with the idea to have the most, uh, the most of it and the most impact. Um, I think there's a lot to be done uh, in, um, in, in, in explaining to part of the ecosystem uh, how the industry works, digital, uh, and, and, and what can be made in terms of, again, uh, releasing project, exposing project, investing money in, in, in promotion and marketing. Um, definitely my point earlier about having more interest in from the DSP is, is, is key. Uh, having very few people to talk to about classical music in the biggest global shops in the world uh, with one of the music, which is the most international is a nonsense. So we need, we need to have more, more support there. And uh, we also need them to invest side of their own platform about making those artists well-known. Um, uh, uh, an example, for example, uh, like when I'm pitching big urban artists with YouTube or Spotify or Apple, they're willing to give me a lot of money to get associated to those artists why to try to expose their brand to acquire uh, uh, new subscribers uh, always have in mind that the dsp primary objective and primary mission is to get as fast as possible as much new subscribers as possible not in a major market in uh, outside of very very few countries sweden uk somehow etc but in france in italy in Germany, 
in, in every other market, we're far away from being in a mature market. What's going to become a mature market is our capacity to uh, uh, and expose and enlarge those offer to more audiences and, and a more diversified uh, audiences. Again, there's no reason why everything that existing in the physical somehow will translate in the digital world. Uh, so people that were willing to discover new artists and um, classical music in the physical world would want to do the same in the digital world. How do we accelerate that? How do we help them to understand that those things are good for them as well? And not only for their sons and daughters that are listening for of rap music, electro music, and, and pop music. So it has to be, there, there's, a big, there's a big switch about A, um, we should push them to invest in editorial. We should push them to invest in having more people to talk to. We should push them, uh, and that's what they do uh, on on Hi-Fi and 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 lots. You know, classical uh, listeners are willing good songs uh, uh, to listen to me. Uh, uh, you've seen that all of those DSP recently, Apple uh, uh, to start with, are willing to accelerate their Hi-Fi and lossless offering. Problem is they want us to invest and pay for extra mixing and estering to deliver them some content that will be at the right level for them to expose. But if I'm talking to the to, to, to my office then the people that are represent, that's extra cost. Why should we pay for it? They should they should help us to pay for it because that's the way if they think this is a great leverage for them to gain more subscribers, they should participate to this. So, and that is actually a conversation we have with them. And we should also think about in, in um, working together to increase, and that's what um, also I think Tabitha said earlier, to increase what we call the RQ, so the average revenue per users. Uh, there's no reason why the RQ is continuously decreasing. We need to help them and think and work with them to increase that RQ, and that start with new offering and better quality offering. And in the better quality of offering, there's a huge lack of, um, of, of resources to, um, to work on the metadata on the classical music. Like when you look at someone that used to go at FNAC or HMV or wherever Target to buy a CD, he has someone to talk to. So he would want to buy uh, a classical recording for, uh, for um, a composition that he likes. The first question he'll ask is, who's the uh, 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 master maestro? who is the first violin, et cetera, et cetera. You don't have those information in the digital world for most of the releases on the vast majority of the platform. This is a nonsense as well. We need to have those information. We need to organize ourselves and the DSP needs to help us to adapt our uh, offering to the way people that are willing to consume classical music want and need to consume classical music. So anything you can help us to do so is, is will be, I think, interesting. Uh, so we need to encourage this and and, uh, and 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 then leverage that out to, all right, okay, because developing an artist in 50 country, very difficult, very expensive, very risky. Let's start in developing them in three, in five, and seven, and 12. And let's do that market for market, depending on what the data tells us. And let's coordinate that with every partner of the artist in the same ecosystem. So work with the management company, the production company, the live production company, the, 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 the publisher, whoever, and let's uh, uh, nourish them with the data and say, hey, we think you know the effort for the next six months should be Germany because the data shows us that and we have some people to work with on the ground with Germany and step-by-step step doing so. So we also need, and that's something we worked a lot uh, um, when I was at the board of, uh, of, um, of the Bureau Expo, which is not part of the, of the CNM and Francoise was there, is to be export ready. And be export ready is, is, is really to make sure that every partner is aligned with the same strategy and willingness to invest time, not necessarily only money, but time and money uh, with the agreement uh, uh, of the artist, because we, without the artist, there's not much we can do. Uh, to spend some time in developing a country, and then another one, and then another one. Thanks, thanks so much, Roman. As the, most of our viewers know, when they see Francoise appearing, it means we come, unfortunately, to the end 
of the of the show. I have a very strong psychological priming effect due to uh, Roman's background. So I hope we have helped people to to have a clear shape and structure of the um, things having changed in our industry in the last months. I hope we empowered artists and managers to uh, to gain momentum. And it's definitely a um, very, very favorable moment. And I'm um, deeply convinced we all believe in the future and bright future of our industry. I have to thank you again, all of you. You have been the conclusive part of our uh, whole cycle, having started uh, already some months ago. Thanks um, so much to everyone. Thanks to Francoise again and to her colleagues at CNM. And looking forward to seeing you for a new season, like artists do and institutions in 21 22. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Eric. That has been a very, very inspiring discussion, extremely rich and complete. And I think uh, everything that has been uh, told, told today uh, was extremely uh, complete and, and completing each other uh, from your background. And I hope that will foster um, new partnerships and also uh, concrete action. So thank you. Thank you again uh, to all of you. Thank you for listening to uh, this panel. And thank you very much to you, Eric. And we will see you again after the summer for the next part of uh, our conversations. Have a great summer and see you soon again. <laughs>